Well, I'm not terribly surprised that it's taken a long time to get here. I'm a little bit surprised that we're not further on now, because even I had thought that by 2019 we'd be starting to be much clearer about where we wanted to go. My point in 2016 was simply that all that you were going to do in these two to three years was the Article 50 process. That's the withdrawal process. You weren't ever going to do the trade and economic and strategic negotiation, because that comes later when you've left. When you resigned as the UK's ambassador to the EU, you resigned in the January yeah. 2017. Your tenure was up in October That's of right. that year. So yeah. you, you effectively left nine months early. That's right. Why? Well, I, I think it, you either needed to go the full distance and see the full negotiation through, by which I mean not only this negotiation, the one that's hopefully uh, about to terminate, and we'll see whether it ever terminates, the withdrawal negotiation, but even the trade negotiation beyond that. You don't really want to change horses in midstream in a negotiation of this complexity. So you either, I think, have to go beforehand or you have to go after it. Now. I'm very happy uh, to do my damnedest to uh, deliver the best possible Brexit, um, both via the withdrawal negotiation and then the subsequent trade negotiation and spend much of my life on it. But you do have to feel that you've got a kind of receptive audience and that you can get somewhere and you can have a real impact on the direction of events. And I didn't really feel that by the Christmas of 2016 that was any more the case. But you resigned your job over that. Yes. Was that difficult for you? Immensely difficult. I mean, I'm very proud to have done all the jobs I've done and a very uh, you know, loyal civil servant. So but were you resign... disappointed that you'd got into a position where you felt that you actually had oh, to go? Inevitably, yes. I mean, it's not something you would, you, you would voluntarily do and you wouldn't want to end your civil service career by, by resignation. But the point is, you still don't even know yeah. what Theresa May thinks. No, I think we all don't know, and I, I think the danger on the evasiveness of the language is that we're still going around the same loop we were going nearly two and a half years ago, and we've still not taken a fundamental decision about direction. And did she, I've got to ask... Now, as I say, I think there are very different versions of Brexit that one, that. that one can pursue, but what the private sector and real people want to know is, um, and what I get a lot from private sector contacts uh, and, uh, and people I talk to in the real world is, could we just have some clarity and certainty about direction over time? Just on the point of resignation, and, yeah. and before we move on, because it's, it's very interesting to get an insight into the powers and how all these things were being decided or not. Yeah. Is there not an argument that somebody like you, with your expertise, should have stayed? Yes, well, you, you have to make that judgment at the, at the time, and you're motivated to stay if you think that you can make a very serious difference over a sustained period. I'd have done it, obviously, if I'd thought that that was the position, I'd have done it for as many years as it took, and as I say, not just the current withdrawal negotiation, but well beyond that, because it's a fascinating, very difficult negotiation to do. From what you're hearing, yeah. and from your perspective with your experience, recognising you're not in the talks, yeah. um, it sounds like no deal is very much on the table still. Yes, and a no deal, I think this is the rather strange thing about the UK debate, as if we are the arbiters of whether no deal can ever happen, and if Parliament decides, because there's an overwhelming majority of parliamentarians, that they don't want no deal, it can't happen. Well, it can happen, because the other side can decide to pull the plug on these talks and say, we've given you a couple of extensions, you haven't used the time, nothing has really happened we're aborting this process. You've already seen the pressures coming above all from Paris, but Paris wasn't alone in saying this in the April Council. If we're cycling through this again six months down the track, I think there'll be more appetite in the European Union to say this is all a massive diversion from the agenda that we need to be pursuing. Brexit does not figure very high up on people's list of the strategic agenda for the European Union. So it could Union. just be easier. So it could just be easier to say, let's abort this process. If these people, they, they don't believe, candidly, that the British should want or really will want to go to a no-deal solution. But the mood may grow that if they're daft enough to want to do that, let's see how that, you know, um, they'll see how difficult that will be in the real world. They'll see there'll be no start of any trade negotiation until they come back to the table with something on the backstop and with the, uh, the same agreement as we had on money. We will just tell them that no trade negotiations start until we've been through that loop. And let's see what happens then. I think the, it's the other side who could truncate this process and decide that no deal is the right solution. You, you talk about a different leader of yep. the Conservative Party at the moment. That would mean the Prime Minister, of course, changing. Yep. Um, who do you trust? Well, I wouldn't want to sort of, you know, name names or, you know, go through the runners and riders for the leadership. Uh, I suppose... Um, but you must have a preference because it is such an important negotiation. Uh, yes, and I think the 
danger that we face and that everybody faces, and I think people are acutely conscious of this incidentally in Brussels and Strasbourg and Paris and Berlin, is that if we were to have a Conservative leadership election, might we have a sort of 2019 version of the syndrome I described in 2016, where in the process of appealing to the party base, which is after all more fervently Eurosceptic than many of the parliamentarians and may well want a, a more true believer Brexiteer as their leader, will various candidates give pledges as to the future direction of the Brexit talks and what they would do in phase two that will essentially wreck any prospect of phase two succeeding. So, for example, if people were to give commitments saying, you know, well, when I'm in power, if you, give me, if you give me this job, I will reopen the withdrawal agreement, indicate that we can't possibly accept the backstop and take a much more robust and bellicose position with Brussels. Well, that leads fairly inexorably, I think, to a breakdown of the talks. If I could ask you one more question then about what we do know. Yeah. If you were an MP, would you vote for her deal? Well... That's an Im almost impossible question, and I'm glad I don't have to answer it in practice. The reason I would, in the end, vote for a withdrawal agreement is I don't believe that the alternative of going to no deal is going to be better for the country. Finally, I hate to end on this note, but because you have been described by some as a pessimist about this all, where, where are your levels of pessimism versus optimism at the moment? Well, I, I would think, I, I, short term, I find it quite difficult to see the path through the next few months in a way where this ends uh, easily, either in May or June or uh, by October the 31st. Maybe that's too pessimistic. Long term, I'm optimistic and always have been about the country because I think there's lots of strengths to the UK. We're going through a very tumultuous period. That's fine. I mean, this is a political revolution, maybe a constitutional revolution. It's bumpy. It'll be difficult. It could get more tumultuous. We have a very robust system that usually can manage that. We have real strengths to our economy. We have some real weaknesses as well on productivity, but we have real strengths on the labour market. And, uh, you know, we have strengths that many in the Eurozone don't have. So medium long term, uh, I've always been optimistic about our future. The thing that always preoccupied me as a bureaucrat and, I, and preoccupied me in 2016, both before and after the referendum, and has preoccupied me ever since, is how do we get over these eight to ten years of transition? The three years we've already had, which, let's be candid, have not gone wonderfully and have been tumultuous, but we haven't got very far with the fundamental question about what is our economic model post-Brexit, do we, where do we want to go and why do we want to go there? As I say, that was inevitably going to be controversial. It's going to be controversial for years, but we haven't got very far in that process, and I would be disappointed. I, I actually think I was not pessimistic enough in 2016 about where we would have reached by now. I'm hoping that we can construct a process which brings the country behind some version of Brexit to which a very significant majority of the country could become reconciled. That needs to happen over the next two to three years. Otherwise, we're going to refight this civil war you know, for the next generation. We shall see. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much.